Hello, and welcome to History 300, the origins of the First World War. Lecture 2 on specific and deep causes. In the Onion's book, Our Dumb Century, the headline for November the 12th, 1918 reads, War over as Franz Ferdinand found alive. The article reveals that back in 1914, the Archduke, far from being assassinated by Gavrilo Princip, had simply wanted to get away from the hurly-burly of court life, and so had decided to disguise himself as a simple Croatian peasant and disappear into happy obscurity on a Balkan farm. As The Onion puts it, the long and hideous war that has just taken place has all been a simple misunderstanding. Now, The Onion didn't come up with this joke. It's actually a very old joke, dating back to the 1920s at least, perhaps even earlier. One of the reasons it was considered funny, even back then, was because from the very beginning of the First World War, it was obvious to everyone involved that while Franz Ferdinand's death had been the immediate or the specific event which had provoked the conflict, the issues at stake went far beyond his assassination. The Western Allies... Britain and France, insisted that it was a war to defend the rights of small nations like Serbia or Belgium, to defend international law against unprovoked aggression, to fight what they came to call Prussian militarism, and to defend democracy. This last point was rather awkward for Great Britain and France while they were allied with Tsarist Russia, however. The Germans, for their part, insisted that the war was the result of a conspiracy of encirclement, that the Anglo-Saxon nations in particular, led originally by the Kaiser's late and unlamented uncle, Edward VII, had deliberately orchestrated the war in order to destroy German culture. These were not the only explanations for the conflict that were on offer, however. As the First World War went on, some people began to blame not individual actors, or even countries, but entire systems. Even though he led one of the major Allied nations by the end of the war, US President Woodrow Wilson argued that the war was partly the fault of the British, French and Russians, as well as the Germans and Austrians, because of the secret alliance diplomacy that had existed before 1914. Wilson's League of Nations was supposed to create a system of international arbitration which would make the traditional balance of power politics of Europe unnecessary in the future. The Russian revolutionary Vladimir Ilyich Lenin had a rather different explanation. In 1916, while in exile in Switzerland, Lenin published a book called Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, which argued on Marxist economic principles that the war had actually been caused by the rivalry between capitalist industrialists seeking to dominate global markets. The war, in Lenin's view, was simply the inevitable crisis long predicted by Marx, which would see a collapse of the entire capitalist system and its replacement through revolution by a system of international socialism. Other explanations, then and now, looked to the armaments manufacturers, the so-called merchants of death, who were alleged to have deliberately fueled the rivalry between the great powers to profit from it. A best-selling 1935 book, War is a Racket, by Smedley Butler, a former Marine Corps Major General and two-time Medal of Honor recipient, argued exactly this. Then there were the inflexible military mobilization timetables of the Great Powers, also blamed. Others alleged that it was the popular hatreds of the European peoples, stoked by nationalist tension over issues such as the loss of Alsace-Lorraine in 1871, which had allegedly pushed statesmen into war against their will. Others argued exactly the opposite, that the war was a distraction cooked up by politicians to distract the masses from domestic crises at home. Basically, people trying to explain how World War I happened have tended to divide into two camps. First, there are those that seek the explanation in the precise decisions that took place during the July crisis in 1914, looking at the specific causes. And second, there are those who look instead to the so-called deeper causes of the war, causes which long predated Franz Ferdinand's death. Each of these camps, specific and deep, 
insists that their kind of causal explanation is more real or ultimate than the other. In this course, I will argue that there is no need to treat specific and deep causes as mutually exclusive options. Indeed, it's my view that if you want to really understand why the war broke out, that you have to look at specific and deep causes together and the complex ways that they interacted with one another. Neither type of cause is more real or definitive than the other. Neither supersedes the other. To try to illustrate this, let's consider two possible but very different ways of thinking about why the First World War began. First, let's go back to that fateful morning that Franz Ferdinand was assassinated, June the 28th, 1914. On that morning, the driver of Franz Ferdinand's limousine took a wrong turn while taking the Archduke through the streets of Sarajevo, and this quite by chance placed the Imperial vehicle right in front of Gavrilo Princip, armed with a loaded pistol. You could therefore argue that a simple navigational error caused the First World War. And at one level, this is probably true. If the driver hadn't turned right instead of driving straight on, Franz Ferdinand would probably have lived that day. Even so, this kind of answer to the problem of World War I origins seems unsatisfactory from the get-go. For one thing, it's totally arbitrary. Why privilege that particular detail of what happened? An infinite number of other chance decisions and events might also theoretically have prevented Franz Ferdinand's death on June the 28th, 1914. What if Franz Ferdinand had ducked in time? What if one of his entourage had acted faster and jumped in front of Princip's bullet? What if Franz Ferdinand had cut himself shaving that morning and his departure on the motorcade had been delayed? What if Princip had been suffering from stomachache and had decided to stay at home? Any of these contingencies could arguably have changed history. But in what way can we be confident that history would have really changed? Perhaps a war would not have broken out in July 1914. But would it have broken out shortly afterwards anyway, just for a slightly different reason? After all, the great powers would still have been massed against one another across Europe. Franz Ferdinand's survival would not have resolved the national crisis in the Balkans, or the rivalry at sea between Britain and Germany, or Germany's fear of a rising Russia, to name just a few things we'll talk more about in the next few weeks. The First World War would not have played out in exactly the same way, to be sure, but perhaps it would have happened anyway, and not necessarily all that differently. So this suggests that we need to look at more than just the contingent events of the summer of 1914. But we also can't lose focus on them entirely. Imagine taking the completely opposite position and saying that the real cause of World War I was, to choose one example, Europe's alliance system. At one level, this is also probably true. Without the alliances, it's unlikely that the July crisis would ever have unfolded in the way it did. Germany would have had no need to back Austria or to threaten France. Russia, without French support, would have been less likely to act aggressively against Austria, and so on. But this answer is also unsatisfactory. After all, the alliance system that existed in 1914 had also existed in 1913, but there was no war that year. And it had existed in 1912, and 1911, and 1910. Russia and France had been allied since 1892. Germany and Austria had been allied since 1879. Why hadn't these alliances previously caused a war? It's not as though there hadn't been a crisis of the type caused by Franz Ferdinand's death before. On the contrary, European diplomacy at the turn of the 20th century was punctuated by constant crises, some of them much more urgent than that of July 1914. France and Britain had almost gone to war in 1898 over a quarrel in Africa. Germany had seriously considered launching a preemptive strike against France in 1905. There had been previous Balkan crises in 1908 and 1912 and 1913. None of them resulted in a war between the great powers. Why was the crisis of 1914 different than all the others? What specifically happened that summer which made war possible in a way that it hadn't been before? Looking at deep causes alone won't answer that question for us. It's important to remember that alliances don't cause wars. People cause wars. Alliance politics, 
along with imperialism and militarism and nationalism and all the other isms, is an abstract concept. It has no consciousness, no agency. Somebody or some group of people had to decide to go to war in 1914. Certainly their decisions were definitely influenced by alliance politics or many of the other isms we've talked about. But at the end of the day, however much they may have claimed that they were being forced to do things, that events were out of their control, peace or war was still their decision to make. It's important to place human beings at front and centre of the World War I origins debate. Imperialism didn't sign a mobilisation order or recall a bunch of ambassadors. People did. So when considering the reasons for the war's outbreak, we will give equal time to the deep and specific causes of the war. And we'll begin next time by taking a tour of Europe in 1914. See you then. <laughs>